confusions. <clears throat> um, identity is a very, very important aspect of our lives. And we go along life gathering various different identities. We can call them masks or um, even lenses that we wear, but they are all these different identities. And, you know, in the Brahma Kumaris, we talk a lot about um, the labels that we gather. Um, we start off life as children with um, very simple labels. It's a boy or it's a girl. But as life continues, these labels just increase and increase. And this is really what causes our mistaken identity. And uh, Mike refers to this mistaken identity as the ego. And we talk a lot about the ego, don't we? Um, normally, we see the ego in others, not so easy to see the ego in the self. But I want you to take a moment now, and if you have pen and paper, or you can just contemplate it because this exercise is just for you, um, I want you to think about when you hear this word ego, what does it actually mean to you? you know, we hear about it. We identify it when somebody has a big, uh, you know, arrogance, when they have arrogance. But what does it really mean to you? And let's just go into silence just for a minute and think about this very important subject. Thank you, an interesting exercise. And um, Mike says that there's no wrong answer, there's no right answer. For each of us, we will understand the ego differently. It will have different connotations for us. But uh, let's explore it a little bit because um, this, this movement away from the true self happened as we created these, what Mike calls, misidentifications. And um, so let's think of a couple of examples that may help us to really understand what it is that gets in the way of me being my true and authentic self. I often use the example of, let's say a man, we'll call him Jim. And Jim is the manager of the factory. And he has been the manager of the factory for 35 years. One day Jim comes to work and uh, the boss calls him in and, uh, and uh, makes him redundant. So in about five minutes flat, that identity of I am Jim, the manager of the factory, doesn't exist any longer. Now let's see what happens to Jim in that process. Um, he will go home and 
over a short period of time, he will have to get his head around the fact that a very big identity of his no longer exists. He's still Jim, but he's not the manager of the factory. And what, what does that do to people, if you think about it? You know, it creates, first of all, an identity crisis, because if I'm not the manager of the factory, then who am I? So we can see how some big labels that we take on completely overtake our identity. And the truth is that it creates an enormous amount of anxiety, unhappiness, even anger, um, and tremendous insecurity. Just the loss of one of the big identities. Now, the truth is we know that it is just a label. We know that. We know that behind Jim, the manager of the factory, is the authentic self, the original true self. And so the beauty is that when we take on what we call a false identity, it is temporary. This is good news for us. However, even though it's temporary and what is real is still there, hiding behind the temporary, we can still hold on to those identities for our entire life. And they are, and we'll see as we go along um, with uh, our exploration, we'll see how there's a deep connection between our negative emotions, our sadness, our suffering, our anger, our frustration. There's a deep connection to these false identities. And if we think about it, we spend our entire lives gathering one or another, and then eventually many false identities. Let's take another example. Let's say I'm married and I take on the identity of being married to the professor, let's say. And um, that identity becomes a source for me to feel some sense of value, importance, and, uh, and that becomes part of my persona. But let's say one day, the professor dies, or worse still, the professor divorces me. And suddenly, that identity doesn't exist anymore. And we can see in our lives and in the lives of those around us that these big events are happening constantly. And they are very traumatic when that big identity that we've created for some reason or another is no longer there. To say it creates an identity crisis, well, that's part of it. But it is also the source of uh, an enormous amount of pain. It's good as we go along for you to start thinking about situations in your own life that you can begin to identify that are um, things that you identify deeply with 
but that are not actually your true self. So I was doing that exercise this morning. And two um, instances in my life came up for me. <clears throat> and I'll share them with you. The first one, I think I was in my early 20s when I experienced a broken heart. Anyone had a broken heart? <laughs> it's rather a strange expression. But a broken heart is very painful, especially when you're quite young and, um, and inexperienced or naive. So what actually happened? Now, if I think back, it was very painful. And um, what I sensed um, afterwards was that I had, I had to let go of a part of myself. And that was very painful. So what did I have to let go of? I had to let go of an idea that someone else loved me as much as I loved them. So that was the image that I had created internally. And it's a powerful image. And, um, and it's what we do. It's one of the things that we do. So when I was so-called rejected, what I had to do was I had to let go of that image. And the ego is exactly that. It is an image that we create in our consciousness, which is me, of something or someone being in a particular way that is going to support that image that I have created. So can you see how we even create expectations? And so when when that um, image no, no longer was supported, it had to be released. Because if you hold on to it, it's what Mike calls, it's a delusion. And um, the longer we hold on to it, the more painful it is. So I remember at that young age thinking, well, if I'm not that, if that is not reality, then who am I? And I remember very clearly an identity crisis and actually coming into a feeling that, you know, there's nothing there. If I have to let go of this idea, then what is left? And it knocked my confidence tremendously, as these things do. Um, but the confidence was based on an image that I had created. It was not based on my true self. So that was one example I wanted to share. The second example was um, in more recent years. <clears throat> when I was diagnosed with cancer. Now, that also, um, at the time I didn't realize it, but that also shattered an illusion that I had created that is not conscious, but many of us do create this illusion that somehow these things happen to other people. They don't happen to me. And then when they happen to you, uh, again, that image that you create, kind of being invincible in a sense. And as I say, it's not a conscious thing. It's just there. And then something happens that is completely contrary 
to that image that you have created. And again, you know, it's um, what we might call the death of an ego. And uh, of course, the ego doesn't want to die because it's integrated itself into your, the very fabric of your identity. And, and that's why it's painful because when something happens and the ego has to die, um, it, it uh, puts up a, a good fight actually. But in reality, if we can drop that ego um, and recognize what is happening, it is a gift. In all cases, whether it's a broken heart or you know, whatever challenges you may be facing, um, the pain you're experiencing is showing you something. And later in, in these sessions, we will actually join the dots between that false identity and the pain and suffering um, that we experience. I just want to, to read something um, from Mike's book that <clears throat> I feel is um, very helpful for us. Mike says, Realizing and remembering who I am in reality is recognized as the spiritual way to restore peace to a peaceless world. Peace treaties don't work. Trying to fix others doesn't work. Playing politics doesn't work. Going to war for peace has never worked. It's only when the self is liberated from ego that it's possible to understand, accept, and embrace all others, regardless of how big or deep or many-faced the egos of those others are. Well, that's quite a big statement that this is the way to peace. But again, coming back to my own experience, that it took effort and it took inner work um, to begin to see the amazing gift, the amazing benefit that comes from identifying what is not you. This habit that we have of creating an image internally, that's where we do it. It's in our consciousness that we create this um, false identity. So if we create it, we are the only ones actually that can finish them as well, which is good news and it's very empowering as well. And, um, and, and the beauty is that every time we're able to identify, um, Mike has this wonderful quote, he says, everything diminishes under observation. And so, if we can develop this wonderful inner eye of awareness that we are able to notice these creations, they are our creations that we create. If we are able to notice them, just that in itself is going to help us. Uh, and then of course, we have to, they don't, they don't necessarily go away that quickly. We have to continually see how they show up in our lives and continuously call, cause us some kind of pain, which is what you were discussing this morning. 
And pain can be very gross, as we know, but pain can be very subtle as well. For example, it can be as subtle as a feeling of um, being intimidated. So who is being intimidated? Not the real self, but some image, some false image that I have created internally. That is the one that feels insecure. Why? Because the moment I create a false identity, we call it also an attachment, something is born within us for the first time, and that is the fear of loss. Because egos are always temporary. Remember, they are not the real self. And so they are fragile. And, um, and we see that through the different emotions that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm going to close and then we can have some uh, comments and questions if you have any. I just like to quote, close again um, with uh, a uh, quote from Mike's book. <clears throat> Why do we lose our ability to be in our true state of consciousness? Why do we create a false identity in a hundred ways hundreds of times every day and not even realize that we do so. Unless we see and understand this process of miscreation, we will not be able to free ourselves from our inner prison. There will always be something in the way. Consequently, we may never know true love or authentic happiness in our own life. So that's good enough motivation for us, isn't it? To really recognize the egos that have woven themselves into the carpet of our very being. And uh, some say ego is necessary. But that's like saying pain is necessary. And our natural state, of course, is to be free. And that means free of all types of pain. And that's what we're aiming for. So let me stop there. And I invite your comments, your questions, your thoughts, your challenges to this important subject of identity and misidentity. So please feel free to unmute um, or to, you know, put your comments in the chat. We would love uh, to hear from you. So do feel free to do that. Does it make sense to you? Let's have a look in the chat. Someone um, near has uh, typed ego is I. So that's a very interesting comment. Thank you. You know, this word I, the smallest word in the dictionary and yet the most powerful. And um, it's quite interesting, and you can experiment with this. Try to leave the word I out of your vocabulary. Well, you can be brave and try to do it for an hour. 
and see what happens because it is the most common word that we use. And normally, when we use the word I, we are referring to the false identities of the self. But Mike also used, uses this term, the I that says I am. So of course, that would be the true self. But because we've got so intertwined with the false identities, we use the word I predominantly for, for those. And you can just feel, you know, when we say, I think um, my opinion is, you can, you can feel that energy of that which is not authentic. The authentic self is by nature humble and not humble in the sense that people can walk all over you because there's power in the true self. So thank you for that uh, comment. And then we've got Debbie, by stepping back from the situation, it's easier to identify whether it's my ego or my true self and see the difference. It's quite amazing sometimes and sometimes amusing. You know, actually, this is a beautiful point. Thank you, Debbie, because one thing the ego does not like, and that is to be laughed at. <laughs> So I have found that when I see the ego in the self, I just have a good chuckle. And you can feel the resistance that comes from within. But such a good um, practice to have. And this aspect of observing. You know, we are, um, we are the audience of our own lives. And these images that we keep creating within are like our indoor cinema, but indoor in here. And uh, so, you know, when you're watching a good movie, you can have a good laugh. So stepping back, observing, and having a good laugh. Thank you so much. And uh, Nana? Om Shanti, may I please know how the ego develops? Can thinking that I am less important than someone be considered as the ego being at play? Well, thanks. Um, that's a um, very helpful question, actually. So how the ego develops? It's, as I said, this identification. Now, let's take another example. Let's say that um, I do the cooking in my household. And uh, every time I cook, uh, my family says, this is wonderful. And then even the visitors start to say, oh, this food is so delicious. Can I have your recipes, et cetera, et cetera. So every time that is that identity of being the good cook is reinforced by the external, um, by external factors, some kind of acknowledgement, possibly praise, recognition, et cetera. So that becomes part of the identity. We may not say, I am the good cook, but we take it on internally. Now, you might say, what's wrong with that? But let's take the scenario a little bit further. Let's say one day someone in my family says, um, I'm afraid, Belinda, this is not up to your usual standard. It doesn't taste so good. Do we like that? Or is there just a little scratch inside of discomfort? And then we overhear a conversation 
that says, um, Belinda is a little bit um, off uh, key at the moment. I noticed her cooking is not so good. I wonder if there's um, some problem. So we start to notice, oh, somebody is talking about my cooking. And then we see two people whispering in a corner. And what does the mind do? It thinks, oh, oh I wonder if they're talking about my cooking. Now, I'm just using a simple example. But can you see how quickly and easily we take on a false identity and we take on all the probabilities and possibilities of experiencing some kind of pain, some kind of discomfort once we do that. And then if someone outright insults our cooking, then it's very painful. And then we have to think about dropping that ego and uh, well, that's a good thing, because after all, if someone doesn't like my cooking, I can look at improving, or I can say, well, everyone is entitled to their own taste. So if I'm out of that ego, I can take that position. So what about the, the victim, the poor me, I'm not good enough? That's also an image that I create on the screen of my mind about myself. So whether it is uh, I am better than or I am not good enough, it is still a false image that I'm creating. It is not my true self. And so we have to look at any of these things that actually come up. And then Maseka, the title, are part of our roles in the world. It is a pity that we confuse it with our identity. I wonder that when a person's role in a drama is that of being a thug, will the artist think of being a thug? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, these roles, these roles are the hats that we wear. And actually, there's nothing wrong with wearing hats. The problem comes when we identify with those hats. And that's where we create the ego. You know, if I'm a mother or if I'm an employer, I have to play that role. But at the end of the day, and actually many times in between, we have to take off the hat. And even when we're wearing the hat, can we be our authentic self? Because that's when we feel really connected to our truth. So beautiful comments, thank you so much. Sharad, Om Shanti, could it not be said that the journey requires us to have a variety of experiences such that we have a deeper understanding, that we have a deeper understanding of the opposites contained therein? I say this as some who may not have certain experiences in moderation, could get them wanting to experience the extreme. Yes, experience is a very, very valuable thing for us because the truth is the greatest teacher is experience. In fact, in the teachings of the Brahma Kumaris, we actually say that experience is the greatest authority. And experience is definitely something very, very useful to us. However, pain, suffering, um, anxiety, worry, we will see as we go along how all of this stems from this false identity. And it is this false identity that is in the way 
of being ourselves. And so let's stop there because we want some time, a little bit of time for some reflection on this subject. So I invite you to sit back and um, relax and turn your thoughts inwards and become the audience watching the screen within. So many things come up on the screen, like any movie. Thoughts are our creation. And perhaps right now, we are able to reflect on an image that we have created of ourselves. It could be a role that we play, or it could be more subtle than that. An identity that we carry. And as we mentioned, these identities are not permanent. If my identity is based on the looks of the body or the fitness of the body, at some point that will go. In the same way as the identity is based on talents and skills will not always be there. Our spiritual work is to identify what we have identified with. To be so aware that when an emotion emerges, a painful emotion that causes some suffering, that we can pause and reflect and see the root of the pain. That pain, whether it is hurt, anger, resentment, is coming from something that is not true. What a wonderful thought. We can move into that which is true. that self that is actually beyond all suffering, naturally peaceful, loving, joyful, very essence of the self. Om Shanti. Thank you so much, everyone. And let's have some homework. Let's see if we can really identify what's in the way 
of the true self, of being yourself. Om Shanti.